Welcome to today's webinar. Um, today we are talking about energy efficiency concepts in sugar house operations. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me to present uh, today this topic introduced by Christine. Uh, I'd like to mention that this uh, topic has already presented at the ICIT conference in Orlando uh, this year. Let us start with the key requirements in the refining process, which need to be fulfilled. So what we are expecting is achieving a specified quality, achieving a maximum yield, achieving lowest possible energy demand. Energy consumption is really the key performance indicator for an efficient operation in a sugar refinery. And to a large extent, it's determined by the reduction of energy demand in crystallization. Uh, and there have been a lot of concepts for several decades being used in crystallization for the automation process uh, to make this crystallization processes uh, reproducible. And now with the increasingly automated process, uh, there's a lot of requirements coming up to document the knowledge achieved and also to apply them later on in a targeted way uh, in the process in daily operation. And uh, this is uh, the way with the reproducibility also to make processes uh, uh, or to optimize the processes based on this knowledge. And if it is utilized uh, for optimization, it can also give a clear uh, reduction of the energy consumption uh, in the daily operation. Now let's have a short look what I like to uh, uh, present today. Uh, it's about the achieving the energy efficiency. There are some examples out current uh, operations. And then I'd like to uh, go a bit back uh, to the point of implementation of seeding systems and syrup washing measures, which can be used for sugar house operation uh, and for the optimized operation there. Uh, then some words to new control cycles in this context and for sure at the end, some prospects for the future, which can be taken out of all these subjects. For sure, some conclusions. Okay, let us start with the conventional uh, sugar refinery. And the energy demand in the refinery is largely determined by the water evaporation, evaporation during the crystallization. And for sure, by all the water that is added uh, mainly by the fine liquor, wash water and screen washing at the centrifugals, the condensate for melting different sugars, dilution during crystallization, or any kind of hot water cleaning. Uh, and now these different effects of energy saving measures can be shown uh, based on various balances, uh, which are based on quite high pole uh, raw sugar. So all the balances shown in this presentation are comparable, so it's no need to talk so much about the preconditions. So the first balance I'm showing you here uh, is for the conventional refinery. You can see the fine liquor bricks is still on a quite uh, normal level. Uh, match plants are in operation, the two-stage evaporation plant, and under these conditions, it's a quite good uh, steam demand and steam consumption about 0.77 uh, tons per ton of uh, refined sugar output. Now to uh, look for different measures, how to reduce this, uh, there are two measures that can be taken here. The first one is change the fine liquor dry substance content. Now there is a target 77%. Uh, 
it's here and there already in discussion. And for people who are in daily operation, no, that's quite a tough target, but it's already executed. Second thing is minimizing centrifugal wash water uh, at the refined sugar station. And uh, now looking to the same uh, balance structure, it's quite clear. Uh, to increase the fine liquor bricks, we have to create some condenser loss. Uh, but at the other side, we can save uh, steam during the evaporation in the batch pans. And the overall steam consumption can be reduced to something like around 0.69 tons per ton of refined sugar output. Now, looking to the condenser loss mainly, there's another measure also has been executed uh, executed in a number of new refinery projects. That's the point that we use the continuous pan, VKT for example, uh, for the oven product. Yeah. And going to this point, we have a big advantage as we can roughly 75% of water evaporation of the oven product we can execute in a continuous vacuum pan. So we can utilize the vapors from the first evaporation effect as heating steam in crystallization. And uh, we can also keep the pressure in the first and second effect in evaporation on a quite acceptable level. And the condenser loss compared with the previous example can, can be reduced further down. So just keeping everything on the same level just by this measure, you see we can come down now with our steam consumption to something around 0.61 ton per ton refined sugar output. Now let's come to uh, the second point. And it's important to keep the crystallization uh, in a good optimized condition. So talking about implementation of seeding system and zero washing is one of the basic measures to support this uh, proposed changes uh, in the refinery concept. So looking first to the demand is if we want to save energy, we try to keep the heating steam as shown just before on a quite low level as possible. And what does it mean? We are selecting larger heating surfaces. And looking to the batch pans, we have the disadvantage that we have an increased volume at the beginning of the crystallization process relative to the final volume. And out of this, we have a basic dilemma. In the, if we look to the traditional one stage process with slurry seeding, we have the two effects. At the beginning of the crystallization process, the heating surface is much too large because the water evaporation is quite high. But on the other side, our crystal surface, just by adding some slurry, is absolutely low. So more secondary nucleation can take place if we don't take care about the process. And the end of the process, it's just the opposite. The heating surface is too small because the pan is full uh, and the water evaporation is limited due to the high mass grid level in the pan. And if we want to raise this water evaporation further, we can only increase the heating steam pressure, which is exactly against our precondition that we would like to fulfill to go into more energy saving, energy -saving concepts. Now, how to describe this dilemma to illustrate what's really happening? So there has been a coefficient sigma introduced and it just defines the ratio of the crystal surface that's available for crystallization to the mass of the crystallizable molecules which are in the solution. There's this nice equation showing this, this crystal surface as a sum of the surface of all the crystals. 
and this available crystal ball uh, mass, that's just the difference sucrose content between our supersaturated sol solution and our uh, solution at saturation. So in the small graph here at the side, just looking to the blue curve, we can see the effect and the development of this uh, coefficient during the normal batch pan operation with the slurry seeding. So we are starting off the seeding with a very, very low value describing this dilemma. And at the end of the process, we are going up to a figure around 1000 uh, square meter per kilogram. So to compensate this dilemma, there have been already in the 1980s, a number of seeding system introduced to just overcome this dilemma. So let us leave this graph for a moment and look to the uh, different options uh, of seeding systems. So this, the first step that was introduced is a, a first seeding stage as a cooling uh, crystallization process. And what we see here on the graph is what BMA develops in the 1990s as a universal variant of this first seeding stage cooling crystallization. And uh, it was applied in different plant types depending on the individual uh, requirements. Now, the second stage could be an additional evaporation crystallization in the batch pans. In the batch pan. What we see here in the middle, where it is drained in a receiver, pumped with a pump up to a second receiver, and by this fed into another example batch pan. Uh, how, and, and by this, we are creating this two stage uh, crystallization process. In case you only want to have smaller crystals in the range of 0.3 to 0.6 millimeter, we also can apply this in a, as a one stage uh, seeding procedure. So we are feeding this cooling crystals, which have uh, a crystal size of roughly 0.1 millimeter directly in one final product pan to produce this uh, final uh, product. Now, with this uh, different options, let's go back to the graph we have seen before about our coefficient sigma. So it's the same graph, and now in addition to the blue line, we see the green and the red line here. So uh, the red line is showing the development for the cooling crystallizer. And we see it starts at a higher value and it goes up even for the 100 micron to already the, nearly the same figure of 1000. And then where you see the, the line drop down into the second seat stage, uh, we are entering it roughly at a sigma of something like 100 and grow it up and then enter the final product pan again, something somewhere around 100 in this shown example. So we have really cut it out the critical phases in the beginning of crystallization in the low sigma area. What was found out in, in practical experience is that if we are running this coefficient somewhere in the range of 40 to 80, uh, then we will con, uh, avoid uh, secondary nucleation really uh, on a high level, so we couldn't see it in a significant uh, uh, amount. What we can achieve for well, with this uh, operations of different seeding systems, adjusted to the needs in the special cases, an equal and very stable mass grid quality. And now with an equal and stable mass grid quality, we now can come to the second measure, uh, which is the syrup separation. What are the effects on the the syrup, uh, on the centrifugal operation using the separation. Now, let's go through what the uh, 
syrup washing, as it was is also called, uh, has been uh, given to different processes. First of all, it's also a quite very old method. Uh, the origin is somewhere in the 1920s, so it's really old, but there were a lot of problems with the acceptance, especially uh, in practical application, because the precondition to have an equal and stable crystallization could not really be fulfilled. And with all the automation of crystallization and introduction of the seeding technique, more stable mass fit conditions could be achieved. And so syrup washing was more and more commonly used before the water washing to reduce the amount of wash water to a minimum. Now, the first step is very simple. The syrup of an adequate quality replaces just the low quality mother liquor in the mass grid. That's the syrup washing process. And a second step, uh, now the remaining adherent good syrup, and let us name it this, is washed off using only a small amount of water, so-called water washing. Let's look how it works. Simple graph, there are two options. The one, the first one is shown here in the graph, which is quite commonly used for syrup washing. As washed syrup, the own runoff Wash runoff is used from the centrifugal and is pumped by a heater across the centrifugals, a pressure holding a valve back into the green runoff tank, uh, the wash runoff tank. And anything what's not needed here is just overflowing into the green one. This can be adjusted quite well and it typically has a high dry substance, quite high dry substance, and so a little bit higher amount is required than in the variant B, which is just uh, the option to take any feed liquor or similar, uh, like for example, thick juice for the white sugar process. Uh, here normally less, a less amount is required, uh, but we may have a higher melting of sugar and we for sure get some bypass uh, of the crystallization step. So both, var both variants are in operation. Uh, one very important point is that the temperature and the dry substance of the wash syrup need to be constant. Otherwise, uh, we are not getting constant results. And it's not a, a surprise, as mentioned already, the mass good quality also need to be constant. Otherwise, the first precondition also is difficult to achieve. Now, let's have a short look on the typical centrifugal cycle, how that operates. Uh, so, the syrup washing starts directly after the green runoff separation has taken place. The time depends, as I explained before, on the wash medium. Then, after a, a short uh, time delay, the water washing starts after the runoff separation has taken place and less water, wash water is required. There's one important thing. If the water wash comes too late, the sugar already has been compacted and the washing effect is less effective. This is one very important point. And uh, it also supports the preconditions I mentioned before, if we are not able to start the syrup washing early enough, we are running into time problem within the centrifugal cycle. And this also leads us to the last point mentioned here, uh, and that is any kind of safety margins and adjustments will for sure result in less performance. So that's again underlined the important uh, point that we need stable conditions. Now, leaving this subject in crystallization, I'd like to come to uh, new control cycles. A very short wrap up. Uh, 
because if we are want to minimize our energy demand, uh, we are getting new challenges also for the process automation. Because the process must be controlled increasingly precisely with the lowest feasible range of variation to at least achieve optimal process parameters that lead us to the requested product quality. So in truth, it will be important to control several stations or even the whole factory intelligently and as far sightly as possible. And it won't be sufficient anymore to have an optimal process control only for single equipment items. And I just want to give two short examples to uh, show what is meant with this. One point in the sugar refinery is the raw sugar intake. And it should be fed into the process with the most constant quantity and quality possible. Any change of this quantity uh, and also the quality should be conducted slowly and in a controlled manner. And this gives the opportunity yeah, that the process parameters in downstream stations then can be adapted uh, in the already mentioned foresightful manner. And they also can then be based on proven knowledge. Second point is the batch pen cycle. Cycles of vacuum pans should be well matched to each other. Otherwise, they are disturbing this uh, uh, requirement for a very equal process control. The average heating steam consumption uh, of all the pens should be as constant as possible. And this requires an intelligent control of the levels, also in different buffers, like mixers and tanks, uh, and at least the rough knowledge about the volumes of the floating products per equipment item. And at the end, it also requires a higher level control system for the centrifugals to avoid disturbance variables. Now, taking everything together, looking for some prospects for the future out of this. The challenge to reduce, is the, reduce the CO2 emissions from the refinery process as much as possible. That's on the table. And we have some technical solutions that already have been considered as state of the art, but they have only applied in some individual cases. One important measure here is the use of mechanical vapor recompression. So just the exhaust steam produced in the boiler. Now you can change from fossil fuels and replace it by green electrical energy. Uh, energy. So that means new challenges are also our prospects for the future. The combination of several technical solutions and the operation always at the technical limits. Now, now just some opportunities using this uh, mechanical vapor recompression. So the first case, just using what is obvious has been done already, a continuous crystallizer like a VKT with the mechanical vapor recompression. And we can again significantly reduce our energy demand. There's one important point. In this example, a three-stage evaporation plant has been introduced because otherwise we are not able to achieve the goals also to keep the fine liquor dry substance up at this level, comparable level of the 77%. Also, this three-stage evaporation plants have been introduced separately in other concepts. So here it's combined with the mechanical vapor recompression. We are coming up at the end, looking here one to the condenser loss, it's nearly zero. And we have a very uh, little steam consumption because it's only in the batch pans we will still use uh, steam. The BKT is fed by the compressor. And we are going down to 0 0.2, uh, 42 uh, ton of steam per ton of refined sugar output. 
For sure, we can reduce our steam demand further when we consider small vacuum pans in the refinery part uh, to be integrated in the mechanical vapor recompression. So the last example shows now the same VKT again with the vapor, uh, mechanical vapor recompressor, but also one for all the refined batch pans. Now, there is one important thing. The pressure ratio of the delivery pressure to the suction pressure determines the amount of uh, electric energy we need for this mechanical vapor recompression. So for a continuous system, we are in the range of 3 to 3.5, while we are in the batch pans in the refinery, somewhere in the range of 5 to 6. And you're seeing here, the result is quite good. You're coming down to 0.25 bar, uh, sorry, 0.25 ton of steam, a ton of refined sugar output. But looking to the electrical energy, one example here uh, of the, out of the practice shows for a refinery with 3,000 ton per day, we would need for the part of the VKT around 1.3 megawatt in a three-stage compressor, Why we would need for the batch pans something like 3.1 megawatt for a six-stage, uh, with a six-stage compressor. So it's nearly twice, and the evaporation is comparable. So what we can conclude? There are different variants described this process optimization resulting in potential savings and energy demands. Uh, we have essential uh, prerequisites. We need a very constantly well operated crystallization process. There are some measures that can be taken, shown by the seeding process, zero washing. And we probably need and really need higher level automation and higher level automation concept. The challenge for the future is really to have a consistent and complete application of all these uh, measures we introduce in the daily operation. Uh, we can also say it very simple. It's a change from designing a concept into the operation. So in the past, very often the design was the important thing to have a good approach, but nowadays operation becomes more and more uh, uh, important. And some examples have been shown. Uh, and they are only examples. So there we can have further ways of reducing energy demand based on this. And there are a lot of opportunities here uh, that can be taken. And one important thing in general is uh, if no green fuel is available somewhere for our, the, our boilers, uh, as an alternative to green electrical energy, the mechanical vapor recompression offers the greatest potential for the decarbonization of the refinery operation. And that, that's I'd like to uh, present you today. Thank you for your attention. And now we are open for questions. <coughs> Yes, thank you again, Reinhold, um, for your presentation and as well, uh, Daike, for the preparing um, of the slides and as well the presentation. Um, we do have some questions, so um, I will read them for you and mm -hmm. uh, you can answer them right away, I hope so. So the first one I see here, um, as you say, and I I think you already mentioned the result um, that is um, asked here. As you say, heating steam pressure is to be uh, keeping as low as possible. Could you please elaborate what will, will be the exact pressure for better seeding? Um, the question is for the vacuum batch pen. Uh, I'm not sure if I got uh, this point for the for the seeding. Uh, 
the 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 pressure uh, has to be adapted according to the bricks that we have in the in the uh, feed liquor. Uh, we can run a seed pan on a low pressure because we don't have to bricks it up to the same high uh, dry substance as it's used in, uh, in, in the final batch pans. Uh, at the seeding point, we are also not so critical uh, as we are feeding much more seed into the pan. So in an exact figure, it's difficult to say because it depends on, on the individual process uh, what can be applied. Mm -hmm. OK, so I hope uh, this one um, was answered for you. If not, uh, simply just let us know um, in the comments or in an email afterwards. Um, the next one is um, energy consumption in NVR and noise levels are possible to main in norms. <laughs> MVRs are not really uh, uh, the, 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 the key equipment of VMA. We are using them. We know that it's used in, in, in factories. Uh, I guess we can uh, give some, some uh, literature advices. There have been uh, uh, some publications, uh, even already out of the 90s, uh, to get some figures there. We don't have them here right away. OK, thank you so much. Um, the next one is, um, is it carbon footprint to be reduced in refinery? Uh, yes. It's, uh, it depends for sure on the refinery, on the country, on the conditions, how much. And uh, that is a part which has to be defined by the refinery and uh, there. What we can offer is to provide the solutions and what we described here is the solutions uh, to achieve them later on. The big question, do we have green fuel or do we have green electrical energy? That's subject of that country, of the refinery, of the political environment. So there are a lot of factors affecting this, this point. Okay, then last but not least, um, the last question. Um, with MVR and batch pens, are we still having the same amount on vacuum and batch pens? Yes. Uh, it's no issue. It's just the pressure difference between vacuum and the required steam pressure. Uh, and I can influence with uh, the steam pressure I need in a the, in the vacuum pen. I can influence also the amount of electrical energy I have to spend for mechanical vapor recompression because this pressure ratio between these two pressure, that's the important factor for uh, the electrical energy we need for that. Okay, so then again, um, seems like all questions have been answered. So thank you again for participating in today's webinar. Thank you, Reinhard, for the insightful presentation. Um, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, just register for our BMA info and also webinar uh, newsletter and you will get all the latest information for our new webinars. 